Greetings, Guardians. My name is Bife here. Okay, so there's been a bunch of you running around talking about the new dungeon that's going live in a few days, Warlord's Ruin. Frankly, there's a lot we don't know, but the few bits that we can put together do warrant a little speculation on top. So today we're going to dive in and discuss both what we know definitively about the dungeon and what we can speculate about that might give us some more early hints as to the story. Keep in mind, We'll have more out on this topic in the coming days, especially as the dungeon launches properly on Friday. I'll probably have a super quick but super late first impressions video for you all on that day, so stay tuned later in the day if you want to catch that. Starting at the top though, let's talk about what we know. First of all, there are some materials in-game and across all of the promotion for Season of the Wish that we should examine. namely the description under the seal for Warlord's Ruin, and the in-game pop-up screen for Warlord's Ruin as well. To start off with, let's take a look at that in-game pop-up screen, which looks like this. The image gives us crucial information about our objective in the dungeon, which is apparently that we're going to prevent Scorn and Taken from harnessing wish magic for themselves. Needless to say, this is a terrifying thought, but it raises a few questions. First and foremost, who is directing this? The Scorn and Taken are mostly mindless thralls, and they need to be given decisive orders, if we're going to see them in the narrative of the dungeon somehow that's focused on a villain, I would think that it would be centered around whoever is sending the Scorn and Taken to raid this fortress. Now it's likely the case that that is the witness, but I want to put in a word for Zivu Arath. The objective is to harness witch magic after all, and she was the one in the Books of Sorrow to state that our gods should be ours alone, so it's not impossible. I also want to go ahead and point out that this is crucial for the Scorn and Taken to have someone directing them, because ultimately they are mindless husks. Without direction, they won't be able to do anything. And more importantly, they're mindless husks given no will and directive or freedom of their own. They only have the overriding will of whoever is controlling them. So this entire endeavor is a mysterious one at best, but it's likely that it's a case that they're using wish magic or trying to manipulate it so that it can be used by whoever is controlling them. And again, no matter who that is, that is a bad idea. We would see the disastrous powers of wish magic unleashed upon the universe and upon them, but ideally we don't want anyone to be able to control this. Not least because if this is the witness, who knows, they could wish to prevent their plans from being disrupted. And that could be terrifying. This isn't the only initial detail that we can pick up from this image though. If we zoom in on the attached picture for Warlord's Ruin, we can see on the side of the fortress there a banner. That is a banner of a fallen house namely the House of Kings. Now, they're a house that's associated with a survivor's attitude. In a very clever fashion, they decentralized their power and had no single base of operations for most of their existence. They had known holdouts in the Cosmodrome on Earth, the listening post on Olympus Mons on Mars, and they had a major fortress within the tangled shore of the reef. That was seemingly where their Kel was based. It appears that at some point, they must also have taken over this fortress given that their banners are prominently displayed. I use the past tense there because in Destiny's modern times, the House of Kings is all gone. As best we know, they're all dead. Back between the Warmind and Forsaken expansions, the House of Kings Kel was found by Aldrin Sov on the Tangled Shore. Eventually, as time passed, Aldrin returned to the Kel of the House of Kings with the Fanatic at his side. The Kel of the House of Kings thought he had broken Aldrin into subservience and obedience. He was dramatically mistaken. Aldrin and Fickrell butchered his entire house before the old Kel was docked and the entirety of his house was raised in front of him as undead scorn. The House of Kings has all but been wiped out, with their last remaining holdouts likely folding themselves in within other existing power structures namely the House of Dusk, House of Salvation, or House of Light. The presence of their banners here is intriguing, given that it potentially means we can connect a sort of line of custody for this particular fortress. 
You see, this also relates back to the name of the dungeon, Warlord's Ruin, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. It implies that this castle once belonged to a warlord. That means that the ruin likely was conquered by the warlord first. The Iron Lords would then likely have arrived sometime after to either fold this warlord into their own ranks or to kill them, thus passing ownership of the fort to them. The House of Kings likely came along after the time of the Battle of the Plaguelands, when the Iron Lords attempted to use Siva and were destroyed by it. Now, finally, with the house being folded in on itself, the custody of this ruin falls to its new Taken and Scorn occupiers, and we can see how this Warlord's Ruin likely fell first to the Iron Lords, and then, thanks to the banners, we can tell that it was at least occupied by the House of Kings for a time, and likely has now fallen to the Scorn again. So that's a lot that we can get just from the little pop-up image. But that's not all there is. Let's talk a little bit more about the seal for this dungeon, because there is a short description of the seal as well. It reads, Uncover buried histories and lingering grudges within a ruined Dark Age castle. This sentence alone raises a series of interesting questions about what those histories, and in particular, grudges, might be. With the many groups intersecting here in this dungeon, it's not hard to imagine that several grudges might be held by different groups against each other. First, if there's the House of Kings banners up there, it's not hard to imagine the grudge between them and the Scorn. One also has to acknowledge the potential history between the Warlord Occupier of the Castle and any Iron Lords that might have eventually ousted them. And if Wish Magic is involved, then perhaps there are grudges to be considered between the Iron Lords who participated in the Great Hunt and any remaining Ahamkara, particularly Lord Saladin and Lady Ephrodit, who we'll talk about later in our speculation. A quick and unrelated side note that I'll mention here because I know someone will bring it up and this is an ideal point. This does not appear to be Felwinter Peak from the images. Yes, the environment is absolutely very similar. We know that Fell Winter Peak is well known to us, and we also know that it does not look like this. I don't believe this is it. Fell Winter might have once been a warlord, and he might even have conquered a mountainside fortress, but famously he relinquished control of his mountaintop fortress to the Iron Lords, and we know that we have not allowed the Fallen to entrench themselves heavily within this place, so the House of Kings banners being hung up here makes no sense. The facility is somewhat secured by Guardians to this day, and also doesn't look like the art that we've been shown. I would not expect Felwinter Peak to be the venue of this dungeon. It is not the same. Finally, the last thing that we, I think, can definitively know about the dungeon is, well, the name. Warlord's Ruin. Warlord's Ruin in English can refer to the ruins of the castle that we'll be assailing that used to belong to the Warlord, as well as to the downfall of the Warlord in question. Perhaps it refers cunningly to both. This being the castle of a Warlord helps us to understand a little bit more about who this castle might have originally been owned by as well. The sharp-eyed lore enthusiast amongst you, myself included, will likely have remembered that Lord Shax was once a Warlord and did indeed have a castle. He famously also had a grudge match of sorts with Felwinter, who continuously tried to convince him to join the Iron Lords. Compelling as all of this is, and seemingly as it would fit with all this information, I would hesitate to say that this is the case. And that's thanks to a post made on r slash Destiny Law, the subreddit, that gives a little bit more clarification on the situation. The user Legos1 posted with an insight that can potentially give us a little bit more knowledge as to who the fortress used to belong to. In German, the word used for warlord is Kriegsherren. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. This matters because in German, as with many other languages, a word can have a masculine, feminine, and sometimes neuter version. In this instance, the masculine word for warlord would be Kriegsher. The feminine would be Kriegsherren. We see here the feminine version being used, which makes it likely that the warlord in question was actually a woman. This does a few things to narrow down the list of potential warlords. In fact, it makes it very slim. Most of the warlords in Destiny's history were male. 
And, in fact, if you go through Destinypedia's full list of warlords, there's only one name that really jumps to attention. A warlord who was simply known as The Wake. We learn more about them appropriately from the Titan Exotic Lore Tab from the Stronghold Exotic. The Lore Tab for the Exotic follows the Drifter and one of his early crews, liberating some supplies that the Wake kept for her villagers in reserve. It reads as follows. This is how it went. We decide to knock off a little piece of Warlord territory. Scary Lady calls herself The Wake owns this spot. I can't take a name like that seriously, but she's got that hoarder instinct, like me, so she keeps her villagers well provisioned. Well provisioned with an amateur security detail. Easy pickings for my crew. So it starts with me, right? I get us in. I set it up, blow open the doors, and then I hand it off to Otto when the cavalry comes. Now Otto's a sword man. He's all about craft, technique, precision. It's disgusting. But I don't care how he does it, as long as he gets it done. So I just let him do it. And Otto does it so beautifully that when he's done, you're standing there holding your guts in your hands and thanking him for the show. I slip into the supply bunker real fast and quiet, and Otto covers me. He's waiting for them when they find us, and he makes them stop short. Huge guy, Otto. A giant with a sword and the meanest looking gauntlet on his arm you ever did see. He takes out about ten guys armed with rifles so fast, so smooth, that they don't even see me going for the goods. One minute we're surrounded, and then we're the only suckers left standing. This is the only reference to the wake in all of Destiny's lore as best I know, and it's possible that she commanded multiple villages across her territory, which might make it significant enough that it also encompassed a central fortress from which she could project her power. If that is the case, the fortress in Warlord's Ruin might be hers. All this, however, steers us from the territory of fact into the territory of speculation, given that Bungie could just as easily make up an entirely new Warlord for the purposes of this dungeon. We also need to consider, despite the old Dark Age history, that the term Warlord being used here could refer to multiple individuals. The Warlord in question could refer to an old Warlord, or it could refer to a new Scorn Warlord who is leading the group, and therefore is trying to commandeer wish magic for themselves. This might show the title as something that they've stolen from the past, much like anything to do with the Ahamkara at the center of this ritual. But again, that's speculation unto itself. So with that said, let's talk more speculation. And I want to start with the simple question. How are the Scorn and Taken utilizing wish magic here in the first place? The answer is horrifyingly simple. They need the remains of an Ahamkara within the Great Fortress, or a live Ahamkara. No matter what machinations they employ in parallel, be it some dark ritual or incantation, they need Ahamkara as a necessary component of wish magic. So where could these bones or live Ahamkara come from? Well, I'm going to assume that they're dead for the moment, and in my mind that leaves us with three potential sources of the Ahamkara that are being mentioned here. There is the Gelion possibility, the Saladin possibility, and wildest of all, the sensor slash eggs possibility. First of all, let's look at the most mundane of those three, which is that the rituals being employed by the Scorn here are the result of finding a horde of old dragon bones to act as the centerpiece of their gambit for power. There is one character in Destiny's history who has absolutely hoarded bones and made armor out of them, including the bones of an Ahamkara, and that character is also from the Dark Age time period. Their name? Lord Gelion, an Iron Lord. Known for his many knives, this hunter had a den literally filled with bones, which he used to fashion all of his gear. His story is expanded upon in the Grimoire card that bears his name from Rise of Iron. It reads as follows. Gelion wears three knives. Their names are Swiftling, Occam, Quirtus. 
They did much of the work at Black Lona, in silence and at speed. Between the roots of the ash tree that covers his den, Gelion has stacked the fallen bones collected from that one night operation. The scavenged pieces of an Ahamkara, several jumbled coyote skeletons, and a fossil mastodon skull are mixed in with them. The bones are scorched and battered from the various grenades, bullets, and hammers he's taken to them. He keeps extensive notes on these stress tests in a tattered notebook with field armor experiments scrawled on its cover. So far, though, he hasn't tried his knives on these materials. Between bones, in the joints and gaps, certainly, but not on them. Gelion flips Swiftling and catches it by the haft. He throws it, a single smooth motion, and it shatters a fallen tibia. He flips Arkham and throws it, the knife clatters off an Ahamkara vertebrae. He flips Quietus and shanks and pikes Ephrodite. Oh, that's the last yip it's yipped, she says, looking up at the coyote jaw that Quietus impaled. Helmet, would you say? Too brittle, ether bones better. Flexes. The others followed her in, wrinkling their noses. Usually they avoid his dim and earthy-smelling den. Their presence suggests that Felwinter is doing something unpleasant, probably involving screams. Bone, Saladin says. Not carbon bronze, not plasteel. Bone's always available as a last resort. Nothing else is. This is doomsday thinking, Yolda says, kicking aside fragments of bone. We have your back. Our plate is strong. When will you need scavenged armor? If all of you were cut down around me, your light drained past return, and my own armor was shredded, for instance. There is a long silence. You always know what to say to make us feel better, Ephrodite says. I could hide under your bodies until the threat left. Then I'd make a helmet from all your skulls and a breastplate from your ribs and gloves from your finger bones wrapped around mine. There is a longer silence. Despite Gellion's grim survivalist nature and his seemingly, um, poor social manner, I, I, I don't know how best to put that, his lore here makes something very clear. Amongst his collection of bones found in his den are the bones of an Ahamkara, this is one of the few recorded instances of a Dark Age character, particularly an Iron Lord, having the bones of a Wish Dragon, and it gives us a simple suggestion of how these bones ended up in the fortress in question, within Warlord's Ruin. Someone might have found them and took them from Gelion's den after his death. This also accounts for the numerous other potential sources of discarded bones that might have come from all over the system. Whether that is from Gellion or not, they simply could have been relocated. The second possibility, however, is a bit more involved, and that's that this fortress happened to be the place where an entire dragon carcass lies. This is a possibility that is, well, I mean, it's unlikely, but it is tantalizing, which is based on the idea that if there are Ahamkara remains there, this would need to have been the site of a great battle. Luckily, we do know of such a battle, one fought between an Ahamkara and Lord Saladin with Lady Ephrodite at his side. Now to be clear, there isn't a stated location for this battle. That means it could just have easily taken place on Venus or out in the Jovians or on some other place on Golden Age Earth. However, its link to the Iron Lords makes it a tantalizing possibility. We see the story play out in the Transfiguration lore tab, the Scout Rifle, from the Last Wish Raid. It reads as follows. You sure you want to keep on with the axe? Ephrodite asked, reloading her rifle. The voice in her comms was barely winded, even as the Iron Lord leapt to avoid a plume of white-hot fire. That's why she gave it to me, and I am one of the only... A globule of flame licked past Ephrodite's helmet and she tugged at her clasp, shrugging free the now-burning cloak. Why in the Traveler's crack did you wish to fight an actual dragon, old man? Saladin Forge grinned inside his helmet. 
The enormous worm towered above them, bleeding wounds covering its gleaming scales as it reared up for another breath. The massive axe in his hands was dented, scarred, and melted at the tip, but it still held an edge. We are knights, Lady Aphrodite. Do you not want to be a dragon slayer? He charged, and his words could barely be heard over the creature's cry. We are what we survive. If this battle did take place between two great iron lords and a wish dragon, it might have taken place within this fortress. Such a location has not been specified as I've stated before, which makes this an unlikely theory. But the carcass would be a more than adequate source of the remains required for the scorn and taken to tap into wish magic. Finally, and most wildly of all, there is the possibility that there are still live Ahamkara in some regards being involved in this story. This is by far the least likely but most intriguing possibility, and I think it's worth bringing up for two reasons. First of all, Riven's clutch has been scattered. If not every egg was hidden across the ley lines, then we might see one of them turning up here to be used in this ritual. A single unhatched Ahamkara might be enough to provide the scorn with what they require for a wish magic centered ritual. Riven certainly doesn't seem to know where the eggs have gone, so yeah, maybe one or two of them ended up here. But then there's the wildest possibility of all. The possibility presented by an unverified rumor in the lore tab of this season's artifact, the Queen's Foil Sensor. The sensor gives us a lot of details about the Ahamkara and gives them in plain cryptarchy terms, but it also raises a number of questions and reveals a little bit of light on something even more wild, an implication that the Great Hunt was always a failure in some regard. The lore tab, which I imagine we will be referring to in a few future videos, reads as follows. Cryptarchy Access, Guardian. Decrypting Engrammatic File Cipher. Archive Accessed Search. A GH030912. Report Displayed. This report is assembled from the collected journals and accounts of light bearer participants of the Great Hunt, in which the Ahamkara were purged from Sol. Wishes. A verbally expressed desire expressed within audible range of an Ahamkara. This wish is granted through invocation of something known as the Anthem Anatheme, which appears to be a manner of subjecting reality to one's will, similar to a light bearer's ability to affect paracausality. However, little is known about how this process unfolds in practice. Henceforth, the Wisher enters a binding contract with the Ahamkara. Though many Ahamkara will purposefully manipulate or misinterpret the parameters of this contract to draw greater nourishment from it, often causing calamity to the Wisher. Lightbearers are expected to refrain from expressing wants or desires in the presence of an Ahamkara. Verified Ahamkara bones somehow retain intelligence, sentience, and a manner of speech yet to be defined post-mortem. It is surmised that an Ahamkara's corporeal body is not its true form, but a representation. Ahamkara feed by granting wishes. These beings possess an innate ability to alter reality and consume the quantum chaos that results from such an act. This is theorized to allow them to transcend reality. Above information regarding altering reality supported by data confirming species-wide capability to shift form into a wide variety of living and inanimate structures. Wishes, while seemingly less potent and more difficult to initiate, are still able to be granted from Ahamkara bones. Ahamkara are not solitary creatures. Many adults patrol vast distances across Sol alone, but their territories overlap and disputes are rare. While Ahamkara do not typically hunt in packs, there have been sightings of hunting pairs. In fact, they do not appear to prey on each other at all. In one report, a dozen Ahamkara on Venus 
had congregated at a nexus of their territories without conflict. Unverified Three reports from Old Russian claim Amkara wielded the light. This has never been confirmed. Seven Ahamkara that evaded and slew their light bearer pursuers are still unaccounted for. This report is believed to be an error in its totality. Now that last unverified report implies a ton of intriguing things. It requires us to question whether the Great Hunt was a success at all. It requires us to ask if there might be more wish dragons out there or not. But it opens the door to a terrifying possibility that one of these wish dragons might have been targeted by the Taken and Scorn and might have been co-opted for this ritual. If the Scorn were able to manipulate a wild Ahamkara into this ritual somehow, fully grown and alive, the consequences would be disastrous. Living Ahamkara only require the wishing subject to desire something within range and a bargain can be created. I have to imagine as well that if the Taken and Scorn are trying to manipulate wish magic, and they have assembled an egg from Riven's stolen clutch, then they may be able to do something similar. Although one can imagine that the end result of an unborn Ahamkara granting a wish would be disastrous to the young, undeveloped dragon. This, however, is one of those moments where we must remember one crucial thing. As I said earlier, the Taken and the Scorn only act upon the desires of those that control them, and so the other key part to this entire dungeon is going to be asking who is at the center of control. It may well be the witness. If it isn't, we need to think about their individual motives, for whatever they want can be transfigured into reality, such as the power of a wish dragon that they are attempting to exploit. We should be very cautious with whoever our enemy is in this next battle, be they the witness or someone else. But that's all from me for now. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, go ahead and leave a like. And of course, know that you can leave your comments down below in the comments section if you have thoughts of your own. Let me know what you think. What do you reckon is going to be at the heart of this ritual? Do you reckon it's bones, a full carcass, maybe even a live Ahamkara or one of Riven's eggs? Do you reckon it's an egg that's been taken? What do you think? I personally am completely unsure, but I am looking forward to finding out. If you want to catch up on more lore from Warlord's Ruin, go ahead and hit subscribe and the bell next to subscribe to turn on those email notifications. But as per usual, know that your viewership, as always, is quite enough for me. And that in the meantime, my name has been My Name is Bife. Parodasia Arastra. I'll see you, Starside.